Welcome everyone to um, our Lunch Learn Link seminar for the month of October. And uh, just for any of you who may be new to the seminar, if you haven't gotten a notice about it, um, leave me your email address. I'd be happy to add you to the list. It is a seminar of the Sydney Kimmel Comprehensive Cancer Center, and obviously a seminar we hope appeal that appeals to uh, members of the uh, School of Nursing, School of Medicine, and School of Public Health. Um, and today's seminar is co-sponsored by the Cancer Outcomes and Health Services Research Group. And some of you may be from that group, um, so welcome to you also. Um, I would like to remind everybody, Nicole has tickets. She'll be passing them out uh, probably on that side for pizza after the seminar. Um, usually we can just go outside the lecture room and the pizza's there, but because we're in this particular room, the pizza will be down one floor, so just go down to the first floor, and um, between the two elevators, there's a hallway. You just follow the hallway to the gallery. It's right near the Monument Street entrance to uh, this building, so hope you can find it. There'll be plenty of pizza for you. So. Um, uh, let's see. So today we have um, a new faculty member from uh, the Bayview campus. Uh, she's actually a member of the faculty in oncology and a member of the of the Sydney Kimmel Comprehensive Cancer Center. Um, she's still learning uh, about individuals and resources here at uh, at the our East Baltimore campus so do introduce yourself especially if you you know see a connection and uh, wish uh, to develop a working relationship that's another purpose of the of the seminars is to bring people together and uh, and bring awareness uh, to interest in in these research topics. So, so Joy Feliciano um, is, comes to us from um, George, oh, I didn't write it down. George, <laughs> uh, but you graduated from Georgetown and uh, did her residency in uh, he hematology and oncology and internal medicine. Most recently, she was uh, a member of the faculty at uh, University of Maryland, right across the street in West Baltimore. And uh, with the lung program, which is now housed in cancer biology and cancer immunology, she'll be working with the uh, providers there for uh, around serving the neighborhood that East Bayview and we are situated in and in um, identifying some, of, some additional um, factors uh, around disparities in, uh, in treatment, especially. So I bring you Joy Feliciano. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? OK. Um, so thank you to uh, Norma for inviting me to come here today. Um, I'll start off first. Since this is a lunch and learn, I thought it'd be um, pretty casual, so feel free to ask any questions um, because it's also an opportunity for me to learn about your system here. Um, I just actually started about a month ago. Um, I came over from University of Maryland, and before that I was a fellow in hematology and oncology at Northwestern in Chicago. Um, but when I came here, I specifically have uh, been focusing on lung cancer primarily. Um, and when I first arrived um, in Maryland, I was hired under an institutional um, K-12 to really be focusing on combined modality therapies with chemotherapy and radiation. Um, but with a couple turn of events, my interest really sort of swerved away from that and really um, I've been hoping to focus more on health-related disparities, um, patient reported outcomes um, as they apply to lung cancer. Um, really, a lot of my interest stemmed from my clinical experience. Um, we, 
in lung cancer in general. It's a very busy disease. Um, here at Hopkins, um, we're expected to see about 800 new cases a year in our cancer center, and that's just at one hospital. So it's, it's really a very prevalent um, disease. And so I came over about a month ago. I'm stationed um, at Hopkins Bayview, which is where the lung cancer program, pretty much 90% of it resides there. Most of our new patients are seen there. And um, most of our clinical trials are open both downtown and at Bayview. But I'm primarily at Bayview. So um, just wanted to give you a little bit about myself. I'll start off first, um, I don't know that there's too many clinicians in here, um, but I'll start off first by going through an overview of lung cancer and some disparities in lung cancer and talk a little bit about disparities, how they relate to different phases of the disease, whether it's risk factors in developing the disease to the diagnosis and treatment all the way to the outcomes um, that we sort of measure and find important in treating cancer. I'll go into a little bit of what I think can be done and then end with um, how I hope, you know, from meetings like this um, or introductions that we can start to work together um, or, you know, find connections of similar interests, um, not just from a research standpoint, but from a practical um, standpoint as well. So since I'm a clinical physician, um, I'll start off with a typical day in my clinic. A 60-year-old African-American male with a history of high blood pressure um, and a social history of 50-pack years smoking, who started at the age of nine, uh, presented to my office with shortness of breath. He's actively smoking, he lives alone, and his daughter was murdered. Uh, currently, he's unemployed, but otherwise he has a good performance status. That's sort of a measure of how functional you are in uh, cancer patients. And he presented with shortness of breath and was found to have a metastatic uh, lung adenocarcinoma. We talked about the diagnosis, the workup for his disease, but ultimately he had many questions and concerns, such as why didn't this show up on routine blood work? Why should I get treated if I'm going to die anyway? Or I don't have anyone to bring me to appointments. I can't pay for parking or transportation. And so as a clinician, we try to address a lot of these factors. Um, ultimately, we do talk about the treatment for this disease, which would be systemic therapy, meaning chemotherapy or immunotherapy based on the stage of your, your disease. But ultimately, um, this patient is lost to follow up for me. And unfortunately, this, this happens. So just to give you a little bit of background on lung cancer, um, typically when we diagnose a patient with lung cancer, we want to stage a patient and we want to find out more about the biology of the tumor. Um, it always involves a biopsy depending on the location of where you see disease. We want to look at the cell type of the cancer the staging or where else outside of the lung has the cancer gone, and then various studies like molecular analyses and molecular profiles to be um, further categorizing the lung cancer. And in terms of staging, it, again, it's figuring out where else in the body has the cancer gone. It usually requires um, mul multiple different procedures or tests um, that we do um, request the patients to go through so that we can give a better idea of how to treat the, the disease. Um, this is very basic, but in general, localized lung cancer or stage one and two lung cancer um, in someone who's fit or someone who um, is physically strong enough to get a treatment um, typically will um, try to recommend surgery for that patient, plus or minus some chemotherapy. For stage three disease, typically called locally advanced disease, this is when lung cancer has gone to the lymph nodes within the chest of the patient, um, or based on whether or not certain structures within the um, chest cavity are invaded. Typically, that will involve a combination of chemotherapy and radiation therapy. Um, again, this is um, basic, but not um, 
there's, there's more nuances than this. And then advanced disease, which is unfortunately how um, most patients present, is what we call stage four disease. And those are patients who have disease with either pleural effusions or pericardial effu effusions, which is fluid around the heart or around the lining of the lung, or distant spread. And the most common places for lung cancer to spread um, is the brain, the bones, and the liver, and the adrenal glands. And so this is a very very common um, stage of disease that p patients present with. And I would say when I was at Maryland, um, probably closer to 90% presented with advanced disease for me. The reason why staging is important is not only does it help us determine you know, what treatment we want to recommend, but it's also prognostic. So um, sadly, even stage one disease, which is the blue line, you can see that even in stage one disease, um, survival is not anywhere near what it is for diseases like uh, stage one breast cancer or stage one prostate cancer. And stage you know, um, at three B and four um, is really quite dismal. Um, the survival for stage four lung cancer is typically at five years around five to 10%. Um, I briefly went over this, but typically treatment is, by, is determined by the stage of disease. So stage one is um, we usually try to recommend surgery in fit patients. Stage two is typically surgery with chemotherapy if they can tolerate it. And stage three is typically a combination of chemotherapy and radiation. And then stage four um, on average is with systemic therapies. And unfortunately, when we think of stage four disease for lung cancer, um, we consider it incurable um, and that treatments are palliative, meaning yes, we may prolong people's lives, but ultimately um, almost all patients will die from their disease. So just to give you a little bit of background in Baltimore, this is um, data recent, you know, in the last five years, data from Baltimore City. And you can see that the lung cancer incidence rate in Baltimore City compared to the state of Maryland is significantly higher. And that also in Baltimore City compared to the state of Maryland, um, the lung cancer mortality is also um, quite a bit higher, 60% versus 43%. And you can also see that in males, it's higher uh, in the city, males and females, it's higher in the city. And for um, even for white populations um, and black populations that it's higher in the city than it is compared to the state. Now, overall in the United States, um, I think sometimes we don't realize how big of a problem lung cancer is. Um, overall, lung cancer kills more people than breast, prostate, and colon cancer combined every year. So it's almost 160,000 patients, or this is Orioles Stadium, about three stadiums are killed every year just from, breast can uh, just from lung cancer in the United States alone. And so it really is a significant health burden that I don't think um, many people n know about. Unfortunately, it also gets significantly less research funding um, than other fatal cancers. This was data from 2015. These are the federal dollars per lice lost relative to other cancers. And you can see that compared to breast cancer in 2015, lung cancer was getting less than 7% of the federal funding dollars compared per death compared to breast cancer. Or you can see other fatal cancers. But keep in mind, lung cancer kills more than all of those combined. So I'll talk a little bit more about disparities at a more individual level. Um, disparities, it's a broad sort of term that I use. Um, it can occur by race, gender, insurance status, socioeconomic status. And I think what we see as clinicians is that it's very hard to tease out all of these. There's a lot of confounding factors. And in real life, you can't separate all of these factors. Um, typically, socioeconomic status is defined as one's class or standing measured by education, income, and occupation. The other important thing I want to point out is that disparities really can impact all stages of the disease spectrum. So when I talk about the disease spectrum, I'm talking about all the way from the risk factors 
all the way through to the outcomes in terms of survival, in terms of survivorship, um, and in terms of end of life care um, that we see for lung cancer. So there's disparities that we see in risk factors such as um, smoking prevalence or smoking cessation and the development of the cancer. There's disparities in the diagnosis and treatment for the disease. There's also disparities in what um, uh, what are the outcomes in terms of survival or quality of life or palliative care use? And we can see this, um, we can really see this at every phase. So I'll start off first by talking about disparities in risk factors. Um, there is some data that there may be genetic um, factors that are related to uh, disparities in lung cancer. Um, one interest has been sort of born out of the observation that um, African American populations appear to have a higher risk, fact, uh, risk um, for lung cancer despite lower overall um, tobacco consumption. Um, one gene of interest has been this chromosome 15 Q25. Um, primarily, it had been uh, studied in European populations um, and has been associated with um, tobacco consumption and perhaps lung cancer risk, but they are starting to um, uh, study it also in patients of African descent. And so that's an interesting gene. Um, so currently comparing it to um, Af patients of African descent versus European um, hasn't been performed, but it is um, an interesting uh, finding. But I don't want to ignore the fact that behavioral and environmental factors really contribute significantly to these disparities. Tobacco is responsible for 80 to 90% of lung cancer. So in the United States, there's about 250 to 260,000 cases of lung cancer diagnosed every year, and most of those are related to, lung can uh, to smoking. Um, and the truth is that initiation, prevalence, and lower quit rates disproportionately affect vulnerable populations like low-income populations or minority populations. One interesting study where we see how early poverty, for example, can impact lifelong tobacco uh, consumption was this prospective um, uh, perinatal cohort study. And they followed children um, under this, the, on this perinatal cohort study into adulthood. And what they found that children um, who were under the poverty level before the age of seven had a significant, had a 33% um, higher likelihood of starting smoking early. And that was typically between the ages of eight to 18. That's represented by this bar. Um, but also that they commonly, um, they were more likely about 27% more likely to become regular smokers, um, which happened soon after smoking initiation, and they were 38% less likely to quit smoking. We've also seen, though, that sociodemographic factors are independently associated with smoking prevalence um, nationwide. This data is from a large U.S. National Health Survey on drug use and health of over 114,000 patients and or individuals. Um, and what they found is there were various different uh, sociodemographic factors that were each independently associated with um, higher uh, higher likelihood of smoking. So for example, here you can see um, those who had less than a high school education were more than four and a half times more likely to be um, smoking in adulthood uh, compared to people with higher than college. That was a reference. Uh, similarly, with patients um, and poverty, higher poverty was associated with higher prevalence of smoking. Other factors that have also been associated with uh, higher prevalence are things such as food insecurity. So in many ways, um, you know, you wanna think about what are some of the factors that contribute to this? And, and you know, can we always just blame the consumer for these higher prevalence rates? Um, I would argue that actually many of these vulnerable populations have been targeted for generations and that these targeting of vulnerable populations really have um, long-lasting effects, um, such as, you know, and you can see that in this quote from a R.J. Reynolds executive, we don't smoke that, we just sell it. We reserve the right to smoke for the young, the poor, the black, and the stupid. And we see that these types of targeting um, really has a significant impact, um, and that targeted marketing is um, also very effective. 
These were just some uh, data from various projects and various studies. Uh, for example, here on the left, um, this was a study done in Chicago in the 1990s um, by the American Lung Association where they wanted to um, look at the prevalence of tobacco billboards in poor neighborhoods, primarily black um, populations compared to white. And what they found on average was that tobacco billboards were about three times more likely um, to be in poorer or predominantly black neighborhoods compared to white neighborhoods. Similarly, things that also impact smoking in these vulnerable populations is um, strategic placement of low priced tobacco. So this is a map from Philadelphia and I'm sorry it's a little bit small, um, but the dark red is really the clustering of tobacco outlets, so cheaper tobacco, and you can see it overlaps with, um, again, sorry it's small, um, but you can see that it actually overlaps quite nicely with uh, low-income neighborhoods. And so the strategically, tobacco companies will put um, low-priced tobacco in uh, lower-income areas. And now this, um, Again, it's small, but these were uh, information that were released after a large tobacco settlement. And what it shows was sort of the temporal, um, or sort of the calendar of how many tobacco companies would strategically market to uh, low income neighborhoods or uh, predominantly um, neighborhoods with black populations. And they would have things such as family van programs, free cigarettes, sponsoring you know, sporting events, and it really allows them to get into neighborhoods that um, you know, are more vulnerable um, and, and get people at a very young age. Um, another uh, factor that contributes to the risk factor for developing lung cancers, disparities along the quitting continuum. And so vulnerable populations, we also know, are less likely to quit smoking. Um, this, and, and by vulnerable, whether it's um, you know, racial minorities or socioeconomically disadvantaged, they're less likely to be able to um, successfully quit smoking. Um, these are uh, curves from, uh, smoking abstinence rates in the United States over time um, for uh, you know, white populations versus black. And you can see that although it is improving, there, you know, abstinence rates are going up, you can still see there's a significant gap uh, between minority populations um, and white populations. So some of the programs that have been successful at being able to reduce um, smoking and tobacco nationwide uh, and also in vulnerable populations are things such as marketing campaigns where we're now banning cartoon characters, for example, or pick, um, campaigns where we're using graphic pictures uh, for some of the complications of tobacco or tobacco-related diseases. Clean air acts have also been helpful, whether it's you know in the restaurants or in the bars, but also um, they have been able to show that when families are able to quit smoking, that people are uh, more likely to be abstinent. And also raising the price of tobacco has also helped to curb um, uh, some of the smoking prevalence even in uh, lower income populations. But another really important um, factor that needs to be considered is providing extra support for vulnerable populations. Um, that means either telehealth, like um, quit lines, or um, phone counseling and or group counseling for smoking cessation. There was an interesting randomized trial where um, smokers were identified by electronic health records and they were randomized to smoking cessation either by usual care, which was just if you asked about it um, or your physician happened to mention it, versus a um, more supportive um, uh, sort of smoking intervention program. And that included access to telehealth so quit lines, um, phone counseling, also access to nicotine replacement or medications uh, for smoking cessation, and then also access to support groups and actually things such as employment counseling. And what they found, um, at, at least uh, in their short-term study, was that they were about two and a half times more likely to be abstinent at the end of um, the program compared to those with usual care. Now, Still, the abstinence rates are low, um, but it was an improvement over um, just assuming that the patient's going to ask for help or that the doctor's going to uh, remember to talk about. 
So the other area where we see uh, disparities in lung cancer is in the diagnosis and therapy for the disease. Um, sadly, what we've seen, and I've seen this sort of similar graph over and over again, is that those um, who are of low socioeconomic status or racial minorities present with higher stages of disease. And as I showed you before, the stage is prognostic. And so when we're finding patients at later stage of disease, they're going to have a lower survival up front. Um, these are data from uh, the U.S. National Cancer Database, and what it showed was that patients with no insurance or uh, Medicaid, which are the blue and this red line, are uh, more likely to present with stage 2 versus stage 1 disease, or they're more likely to present with stage 4 versus stage 3 disease. And similarly, when we look um, by race, um, uh, white populations are much more likely to present with local or regional disease uh, compared to black populations. Um, we also see that even when patients are diagnosed with, treat, uh, with lung cancer, that there's disparities in the treatment that they receive for their disease. Um, these two graphs are from a meta-analysis of about 14 randomized studies um, in both uh, America and countries in Europe. And what they wanted to look at, was, or what they were looking at, is how socioeconomic status was related to receipt of care in stage for the stage appropriate treatment for lung cancer. And what they found, um, non-UHCS means non-universal uh, health care systems, and uh, UHCS is universal health care systems. What they found is that even in places with universal health care, low socioeconomic status was associated with a lower likelihood of surgery for surgically resectable lung cancer. And similarly with chemotherapy for advanced disease. Now, this was a recent uh, finding um, that uh, they looked at SEER database uh, data where um, patients who had surgically resectable disease, they looked at this for um, black populations, that even in surgically resectable disease, um, blacks tended to have lower likelihood of um, appropriate lymph node dissection for surgery, which is a really important factor um, when we're treating curative disease because we also know that lymph node dissection is important and related to the survival of, uh, of patients. So what are some of the contributing factors to disparities in the diagnosis of therapy? Um, these are just a few that I think really stand out to me as a clinician. Um, from a patient standpoint, there's a lot of misunderstanding about the disease. There's a lot of people that think if you have the disease, it is a, it's a death sentence, and why would I even treat early stage disease? There's a lot of people who um, think, if I diagnose this by a biopsy, this cancer is going to spread because air touches it. I've gotten that question at least 50 times. Um, there's a lot of fatalistic views about the disease, or they've had another family, oh, sorry. they've had another family member with cancer who has died, and that's the image that they think about. Um, there's also significant financial and insurance concerns. People really are concerned about how are they going to pay for their treatment, how are they going to continue to work. Many patients, um, oh, sorry. Many patients need to continue to work to keep their insurance, but lung cancer is a very morbid disease, and it's very difficult to keep working. And there's a lot of mistrust of physicians in general. From a physician standpoint, I think um, one of the factors that sticks out to me is really physician knowledge of lung cancer. Um, especially outside of the field of oncology. I think there are similarly fatalistic views. Um, I see a lot of consults in the hospital where the question is, well, you know, should we just call hospice without even a consideration of that there might be a treatable, you know, a, a treatment available to these patients. Um, there was an interesting survey after the National Lung Screening Trial, which I'll talk a little bit about later, um, but this survey actually surveyed primary care, so internal medicine or family practice doctors, who, who were part of one of the um, hospitals that took place in the National Lung Screening Trial. And what they found was that most physicians, more than 50% of physicians, did not know the criteria for lung cancer screening. Um, they also found that 
the knowledge of lung cancer screening criteria was associated with whether or not that doctor was going to be referring patients for, treat, uh, for uh, lung cancer staging to begin with. And so that kind of touches also, I think, on physician attitudes about lung cancer and lung cancer screening. There is definitely a lot of controversy about how to best implement lung cancer screening, um, but there's also a lot of, um, you know, different perceptions of what we can actually do for a patient. Um, there's also low referrals of specialists for guideline-based therapy, and that's also been associated um, that patients with low socioeconomic status are less likely to be referred appropriately to specialists. Um, and there's also just logistical barriers such as physician time, resources. Um, these are complicated discussions and really complicated patients too. So what else can we do to try to reduce some of these disparities? One interest has been in lung cancer screening. Now this was um, sort of the, um, the, the way that the National Lung Screening Trial was designed. It was published in 2011, and it was a randomized controlled uh, study uh, where patients who are considered high risk of developing lung cancer, so pro primarily current or former smokers, you had to have quit within the last 15 years. Um, patients were between the ages of 55 to 74 years old, and they had to have at least a 30-pack year smoking history. Now, they were randomized to either a low-dose screening CT annually um, for three years, or chest x-ray, which um, is not a truly a form of screening, but that was the sort of uh, arm that it was randomized to. And there was, uh, again, over 53,000 uh, patients on this study. Now, the thing that I wanted to point out, though, is that in this uh, you know, large study, 70, almost three-fourths of the po uh, population were below the median age of lung cancer uh, patients. So this was a a younger population. The median age for lung cancer is about 68 to 70 years old, and you can see the majority of them were actually quite young. The other thing I wanted to point out is that only about four and a half percent of the patients, of the participants in the study were black. Um, the rest were identified as white, non-Hispanic white. The other thing I want to point out is that the majority, granted it's a small um, majority, um, the majority were actually former smokers, and that's important because we also know that current smoking is associated with a higher risk of lung cancer. But what it did ultimately show is that relative to chest X-ray, low-dose CT scan uh, reduced lung cancer mortality by 20%. Now, I think um, a lot of uh, controversy is, you know, how much of a benefit is that really? It was a relative risk reduction. But just to give you a sense, the number needed to screen from that study was 320. So 320 patients needed to be screened to save one life from lung cancer. Relative to flexible sigmoidoscopy for colon cancer and relative to mammography for breast cancer, this is quite favorable. Um, and so I do want to keep that in mind. So as a result, many organizations have recommended low-dose screening CT for high-risk individuals, at least with the grade B recommendation, um, and most insurances uh, will currently pay for it. And what we saw really at University of Maryland, again, why I became sort of interested in the topic is that just within our patient population, again, we saw that African-American patients were more likely to present with later stage of disease and later stage is not curable. So, uh, you know, I kind of got interested in this area is how, you know, how do we really apply the results of the National Lung Screening Trial to the patients that we see? Is this really applicable to our population here in Baltimore? One way to kind of try to approach this question is to be looking at the minority populations that were enrolled. And so one group has actually performed a, a, you know, a subset analysis of um, the participants who identified as black in the National Lung Screening Trial. So again, this was about 
And what they found, and, and actually Hopkins was one of the sites where they had targeted um, accrual efforts for the National Lung Screening Trial. So there was about seven of the um, 34 sites that were identified as uh, institutions that had higher um, minority populations, serving higher minority populations. And so they actually had a targeted accrual um, program, and I don't have the data here, but they could show that by targeted accrual, using a navigator, using you know outreach, that they were able to improve the minority accrual uh, for the National Lung Screening Trial. But nonetheless, even with that, the total overall population of minorities on this, or of uh, black patients on this uh, study was only 4%. Now interestingly, they, had, they were younger compared to the white um, participants. They had fewer years of formal education, they had more medical comorbidities, and were more likely current smokers than white participants. And I, am, I mention this because these are many factors that actually are associated with a higher risk of lung cancer to begin with, and, and one would think, you know, a worse outcome. But when they analyzed the um, NLST by race, it was very interesting because it appears that black participants might derive a greater benefit in lung cancer mortality than white participants. So the hazard ratio for uh, black participants um, for death was uh, uh, with screening uh, compared to chest x-ray was 0.61, so a 39% reduction as opposed to um, 0.86 for white participants. Um, though they found that those with less than a high school education was associated with higher risk of death from lung cancer. And they also thought that possibly there's a wider health benefit in screening black individuals because the overall mortality was also reduced for black participants but not for white. And one, um, one of the thoughts to that observation was that maybe it's because uh, more patients were then brought into healthcare overall, that they had better access to uh, primary care uh, and, and medications and um, health care overall. So why does this all matter? Um, these are just survival curves for various stages of lung cancer by poverty level, by race, and what we see is that they have inferior survival outcomes, whether it's low income or black populations overall, they have a lower uh, lung cancer survival. In Baltimore City, we see relative, um, you know, uh, in, in Baltimore City, we're seeing that the um, lung cancer mortality rate actually has increased in, you know, this was data from, that was collected between 2008 to 2012, but it had actually increased over time. Um, and for those with less than high school completion, um, it actually increased very significantly. But there's other outcomes that I think are important to think about when we think about lung cancer uh, disparities. It's not just survival. You know, it is ultimately a very fatal disease. And so other outcomes that we as oncologists find important are things such as quality of life, symptoms from their disease. Um, this was data that was just published this year from a PANCOR study. And it was uh, cross-sectional data but what they looked at was um, the association of um, financial reserve. So did you have less than two months financial reserve, three to six months of financial reserve, or seven to 12 months? And what they found was that uniformly, um, those with less than two months of financial reserve um, was associated with inferior quality of life on very many uh, levels, whether it's physical, mental, symptoms, um, that financial reserve was associated with worse quality of life. We also see that for those, you know, a, an area of interest in oncology is in survivorship, but we also see that financial burden during therapy has also been associated with lower likelihood of uh, employment after treatment. So these are patients who, even if they're cured, they still have these um, financial complications um, after their disease. Um, but also, we see that um, socioeconomic status is associated with uh, inferior use of hospice for patients. And hospice, um, if you're not familiar, is a service that's provided for patients at the end of life where the goal is to really focus on uh, maintaining quality of life. Um, 
It provides a lot of supportive services, psychosocial, medis, you know, palliative symptom relief, um, and that patients, this was uh, from um, Medicare Medicaid data in New York and California, and that those with Medicaid were much less likely to be referred for hospice services. So what can we do um, as a group to try and address some of these disparities? Partly, I feel like we don't necessarily need to be reinventing the wheel all the time, and that there have actually been some really um, successful programs that have been put out, particularly for other cancers. So one program that's really been interesting me is the Delaware Cancer Consortium. Um, it's funded by uh, the state of Delaware so that cancer screening um, is paid for even for uninsured or underinsured patients. This was uh, results that I'll show you from a colorectal cancer screening program that um, was really impressive. And the goal for their program at that time was to increase colorectal screening um, rates in minorities or under or uninsured patients to target quality treatment and to also use a patient navigation system. So they had uh, nurse navigators helping patients um, not just get to the screening, but also to uh, enroll for healthcare or um, you know, navigate through the system of uh, the, the screening tests all the way through treatment if they were found to have a um, colon cancer. And they looked at screening rates um, after about eight years, stage of diagnosis, colorectal cancer incidence, and mortality. And what was really interesting is that they saw improvements in all of these. They saw improvements in screening rates. So at 2001, only 48% of, um, uh, of the black population in Delaware was getting screened for colon cancer. By 2009, it was up to almost that of white um, patients. Uh, to 74%. They also found that the stage of disease at diagnosis migrated. So in 2001, only about 15% presented with localized disease, which is the most curable stage. And then by 2009, half of patients presented with localized disease. So the stage of the disease shifted as well. And what was really impressive, again, these are, um, you know, relatively small numbers, but it is intriguing that the survival between um, African American populations and whites almost came uh, down to be equivalent. Um, and that was in a short eight year period for this program. And so similarly, Delaware actually has a program for lung cancer screening too. Um, I just got these slides actually uh, complimentary of Dr. Stephen Grubbs, who is actually kind of the director for um, that program. Um, and he's also one of the leads in ASCO, which is our national um, oncology organization. And they've implemented statewide uh, lung cancer screening. The reasoning behind it is that in Delaware, there was, there's about 27, 2,800 lung cancer deaths um, between, in that four year period, and that's about 560 deaths annually in Delaware from lung cancer. And with the estimated reduction in mortality by 20% seen on the uh, National Lung Screening Trial, that's the potential of about 111 annual deaths avoided every year. Now, how they've decided to cover it um, in Delaware, uh, similar to CMS, they've extended the age, though, to 80. Um, you still have to have, um, be a current smoker or have quit within the last 15 years. An important factor is you need shared decision making. So you, it's different than, say, breast or colon cancer where everybody um, at a certain age can get this screening test. Lung cancer, really, you have to be a high risk patient um, and you need to really have a conversation with either a physician or for some of these patients was with the nurse navigator. They also have a screening for life program which covers screening, lung cancer screening for uninsured or uh, underinsured patients in Delaware. And they're also collecting that data to see how many are they getting um, through the screening for life program. Um, there are, uh, when you are uh, interested in lung cancer screening, um, providers are are helping you navigate the system to get the screening test and all the follow-up. And in addition, if you are found to have a lung cancer, navigated through the system of actually getting it treated. Um, 
And then what they did um, e after the screening program started was then also starting to um, document and collect the data on the people from the Screening for Life program. So far, what they've screened statewide um, has been, and it's been open for a little over a year and a half, um, they've screened about 1,900 patients. Um, and these were by, these uh, percent screened uh, is by which hospital program. So there's various different hospital systems that are all part of this screening program, um, including the screening for life. Um, and that's looking at the percent of lung cancer eligible patients screened by program. Um, in their first round, because remember low dose screening CT is a three annual um, CT, uh, there's three annual CT. So in this first round, um, Essentially, these categories are how suspicious the nodule or how suspicious the findings are. And so 7% are category four, which is suspicious uh, for cancer. The rest are either non-suspicious or benign appearing or benign but needs follow-up. Now compared to, um, these are the, the sort of breakdown of suspicious nodules in the first round for low-dose screening by the National Lung Screening Trial. Again, these are small numbers, but I still think they're very intriguing. Delaware compared to the National Lung Screening Trial is that um, a similar percentage are suspicious. So in the National Lung Screening Trial, about 5% of that first uh, round were suspicious. And in Delaware, so far, it's been about 7%. And so far, through September 1st, uh, 27 cancers have been detected. The detection rate, again, I'm Reminding you, these are small numbers, but it is intriguing. The detection rate is uh, similar, if not higher, than that of the National Lung Screening Trial. And for the positive screening results, um, so the tests that are considered a positive screen are abnormal and then found to be a cancer, um, so far that rate uh, appears higher. But again, these are small numbers. And so here, uh, what's I think, again, intriguing, even though it's small numbers, is this are, of the 27 cancers detected, you can see that the majority are stage one and stage two. And so these are really the patients that we're trying to save from dying from lung cancer because stage three and stage four is very dismal. And so this, again, is just the breakdown of the lung cancers that they've found. Um, and uh, again, small numbers, but it is intriguing that more than half are stage one and stage two. And as I mentioned, you know, nationwide or worldwide, um, the majority of lung cancers present with advanced disease. So compared to the National Lung Screening Trial, um, they see, uh, again, these are small results, but they do see that uh, more patients are appearing to present with earlier stage disease. So the conclusions that they have sort of just um, presented are that lung cancer screening is active throughout the state of Delaware, um, that their na navigation and their radiology and their multidisciplinary systems are up and running and on board with this program. Um, the data is being collected, it's placed in registries, um, and it's the first state with the only statewide lung cancer detection program. And so I think we can learn a lot from this. So in summary, um, disparities in lung cancer occur at all phases of the disease, and I think we need multidisciplinary approaches and programs to try to address some of these disparities um, at the different stages where they occur. So where do we kind of go from here? Um, Norma mentioned I'm new, and right now, this is how I feel. I can't, it's a big system. <laughs> and so I'm really trying to meet people, trying to figure out who has similar interests and how they can overlap, because I think um, when I say disparities, it's a very broad category. It can mean disparities at so many levels or by so many different factors. Um, but I do think that there really are, you know, I've only been here a month, but I'm finding that there are really a lot of people who have similar interests. And it's just how to get them together and how to meet them and how to work together um, with some of our limitations. And so my interest right now is to learn what's currently being done at Hopkins, learn who has interest um, in these topics, 
figure out how to coordinate projects across the campuses. You know, I mentioned I'm at Hopkins Bayview. Um, I do come down here occasionally, but truly I'm, I'm not on this campus. And so how do we work um, as a group to try to um, work together but physically be separate? And how do we coordinate across divisions? You know, I'm finding that I'm in the cancer group, but there's people in um, pulmonary who might be interested or people in palliative care who might be interested. And I really think there's ways to um, figure out how we, our research can overlap and how our, you know, it's not just research to me, it's, it impacts the patients that I see on a daily basis. And, and also try to see what kind of resources are available. And so some, as I kind of brainstorm, and again, I'm, I am early here, but some of the potential areas for collaboration, specifically for lung cancer, um, that I think would be important um, and why I think, you know, having access to the School of Public Health is so beneficial is how can we couple smoking cessation with lung cancer screening? Or how can we couple smoking cessation? You know, we don't actually even have a program for smoking cessation for our cancer patients, for example. And, you know, that's something that um, to me, you know, there's from a biologic standpoint, there's a lot of data coming out on how smoking uh, impacts survival, not just for lung cancer, but for many other different kinds of cancer, how it impacts radiation. So there's a lot of ways that I think um, we can look at smoking cessation, not just in the people who haven't developed lung cancer yet, but also in people who have cancer, for example. How do we address lung cancer screening? You know, lung cancer screening, I think uh, one barrier is that many of these patients um, are not necessarily the ones who have a primary care doctor at the time. And so it's one thing to say, okay, we have to um, tell you know, teach the doctors, which I do think we have to teach the providers about lung cancer screening and how it actually can be a curable disease. Um, but how do we get to those patients to a doctor in the first place? And I think that's why, you know, working with community outreach programs and the outreach um, programs that are going on here at Hopkins would be really important. Um, how can we look at other things, you know, other outcomes that are important, such as clinical trial accrual? Um, Dina Lanzi, um, who uh, is, is one of the people who's looking at how to improve minority accrual to clinical trials, and she has a study that's uh, looking at trans providing transportation. Um, because I do think, you know, again, from a clinical standpoint, when I see patients, those are the barriers that really impact so many patients. Um, it's not just does this patient's tumor have some biomarker that doesn't allow them to enter on a trial. I think there's some more sort of bigger picture barriers that I think, you know, people like Dina are, are uh, fortunately addressing. Um, how can we look at patient reported outcomes? We know that cancer care is very expensive and that many patients will die bankrupt from treating their cancer. And so how can we address some of these things and how do different vulnerable groups um, focus on some of these cost implications that they have? Um, and then there's also uh, ways to look at disparities from a quality standpoint. Um, uh, institution-wide and, and overall and a patient quality and a, uh, you know, quality of care standpoint. So, you know, I'm really uh, kind of just brainstorming right now, but I'm any to, I'm open to any suggestions, all suggestions, um, and would love to meet with people who might be interested. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Joy. We have some time for questions and interaction, so we'll take the microphone to the back and, so that everybody can hear the question. If you'll bear with me here. Hi, thank you Hi. very much for this really interesting talk. Uh, you mentioned something about genetic risk factors for lung cancer disparities, and you included the locus. I was wondering if the lung cancer screening also entails like a genetic testing and would that be important in this case? So um, there's a lot of interest in looking for biomarkers to try to figure out who would um, 
you know, early detection of lung cancer. But from a, for the national lung screening trial, um, there wasn't a genetic component to that study. Um, it was really based on these clinical factors because we're trying to, um, you know, related to tobacco because it was really focused around um, uh, tobacco use, combined smoking years and things like that. Now, some, um, some of the organizations that recommend uh, smoking I mean, that recommend lung cancer screening, have adjusted their criteria so that genetic factors such as um, family history can actually be used as a sort of, um, you know, uh, criteria to allow you for lung cancer screening. Um, but there are, you know, yes, people do do. Um, I'm not involved with any of the genomic type projects going on. Um, but yes, people are interested in looking at who might be more risk of lung cancer from a genetic standpoint. And that's why, you know, that chromosome 15, for example, um, really what has just recently been described is that it is a factor that appears to be related in patients of African descent, uh, whereas before mostly it was studied in European. So I think, you know, a next step would be to be comparing the differences. Thank you. You're welcome. We can uh, put you in touch also with some folks at the Cancer Center who are doing the uh, gene, whole genome sequencing and looking at lung tumors versus people without lung tumors also. Other questions today? Oh. I'll just talk loudly so you okay. can have to stand up. So I was interested in your, the very first patient that you described, mm -hmm. the one that was lost to follow. And uh, in your experience, how often does that happen? Like what proportion well, of the population? Well, a lot. Um, I think it's, so I think different institutions, it may be different to really capture that. Um, I can say that when I was at Maryland, I realized how often it was happening because many times these are patients that come in as an inpatient. And because they're advanced disease, they're the patients who are coming in with cord compression and they're paralyzed, or they're coming in with brain metastases and they're seizing or having a stroke. And so they'd get our attention there, and then in follow-up, they wouldn't appear. I think what's at least my observation, and um, Peggy, who's one of our nurse practitioners who helps a lot with getting patients into our system, um, the challenge is if we don't hear about them, we don't know if they're lost to follow up. Sometimes what we're seeing is they come into the ER a month later, and then we realize, oh, they were supposed to have seen us um, after. At Maryland, um, and again, I'm still learning kind of the demographics of this patient population because physically we're in a different location. At Maryland, 40% of our patients were uh, African American. About 40, 30 to 40% were um, Medicaid. And many times, you know, um, the ones who end up in the hospital are less likely to have a lot of support systems who would have gotten them to a doctor in the first place, except now as this inpatient sort of situation. So I think the loss to follow-up is uh, probably more common than we realize because the, as an oncologist, we're only capturing people who come. I think it's really the people who don't come that it's really hard to capture. At Maryland, um, what they started to implement for some of the general medicine services was essentially kind of a high risk navigator for people who were at high risk of being lost to follow up. The challenge was not everybody got sort of referred to that navigator and so again, we'd lose patients. Um, but they're really, I mean, even for educated patients, these are very complicated systems I, I work here, and I, it's very hard to maneuver. And so as a patient, it's very, very difficult. Um, one, one of the statistics from Johns Hopkins Cancer Registry 
for early stage lung cancer is that about 10% don't get treatment. And about half of that 10% right. refuse and right. half are lost to follow up. And you know, even um, my mentor um, at Maryland um, had a large SEER analysis looking at um, rates of treatment for advanced disease. And even though the majority of patients diagnosed with lung cancer are above the age of 65, um, looking at SEER uh, Medicaid data, less than a third actually get treated. And so I think there's lots to follow up for all these social reasons, but I also do think there's a significant portion where it's like, oh, well, you're diagnosed and why treat? Um, and that's kind of a barrier that I face as a physician, even just um, trying to convince house staff or residents or even other physicians that actually we can help people. You know, we may not cure them, but we can help them. Um, we can help their symptoms. We can help them live better. Um, and so I think there's a lot of drop off for a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. And I can probably back it up enough. Okay. Um, to that point, I think there's also a lot of when the diagnosis is relayed to the patient when they come into the ER. And it may, it is most likely not an oncologist having that conversation, that it is internal medicine. And they will say, this is stage four, this is not curable, there's very limited what can happen, do you want us to refer you to hospice? And right then they're so shell-shocked that they most likely say no, but then in the next week or two they also don't pursue any follow-up for any with an oncologist or anything because once the news settles in, the patient will say, well, there's nothing that can be done. And, and I, I think don't want to linger like this. I mean, I think um, kind of what I tried, and it's on a small scale, but even just from a clinical standpoint, I really try to get the residents, um, even in internal medicine, or I had an MPH student um, come with me to clinic to see how patients can actually be okay in, in the clinical practice. Um, and I think that actually always surprises people because we see people as an outpatient, but in the inpatient, you would sure you'd think everybody's on death's door. Um, and so, you know, just trying to make people aware that there are things we can do for patients. Um, there's also very, I think, you know, even when I was in medical school, which wasn't too long ago, um, we really had like one chemotherapy regimen. And since I've graduated just in lung cancer, there's at least 15 drugs that have been approved and different variations of lung cancer that I, my longest um, living patient with metastatic disease to the brain is now 10 years. Um, and so it's really difficult to try to remind people that there are patients that can do okay uh, because typically it has been a very, it is, it is a dismal disease, but we can help people. So I think we'll adjourn now to the pizza in the gallery um, for those of you who came in later. So uh, did Debbie just tell you Anna Bacher? Okay, yeah, yeah. It, we had um, some discussions about what room was actually available. Um, I believe it will be the gallery. So the gallery is the is the lobby right off the Monument Street entrance. So go down the elevator and uh, look for the passageway between the elevators <laughs> to get there. Um, but thank you so thank much, you. Joy. I, I recognize some of the folks here, um, and they definitely have interest, so you may be hearing from okay. them. Mm -hmm. You can you. ping me.